Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this, pro this program is basically to speak about um, what we're going through in the middle belt. Um, pardon my, the speakers, um, the, most of them don't use Clubhouse, so they just had to download the app. So you could give them a few seconds and they will be here. But yeah, um, the middle belt is going through a lot right now. The problem is that we don't have many of these people on, on social media um, that would really go into in-depth analysis of what is going through in the middle belt. So I'm trying to bring more middle beltans to Clubhouse, to Twitter, so that we can have these conversations so that we can share our experiences in the Middle Belt with people from the South, uh, the Southwest, the Southeast, and the South-South, just to get um, a real-world analysis of what it feels like being a Middle Belter, the politics, and, and the, the, the crisis that has engulfed this region for many years now. Thank you so much. My guru, I can see you there. Please, I'm, I'm sending you an invite. Uh, 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 My guru, please mute your mic, please. All right. I just made you a moderator. Uh, Patrick, are we good to go now or are we still waiting for yes. more people? Yes, so, yeah, so I think um, since IY Mela is here, we can, we can go ahead. Um, so I would just like to give our speaker time to introduce himself and he can share his experience of the Middle Belt and, and his lived experience. Um, he's from Gombe. And he will tell us of, of the issues going on from traditional rulership in the area to the conflicts in the area and what he has seen and the way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. My brother, my guru, you're welcome to the platform. Uh, please unmute your mic and uh, please go for it. All right, good evening. Good evening, guys. <clears throat> I trust everybody is doing okay. Please, can you hear me? I want to be yes, sure that yes, 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 we can hear you. You know, you know, well, I don't know where most of you are, but you know, I, I am in Nigeria. I'm, I'm presently in Nigeria, and in Nigeria, we usually have network problem. So whenever, <laughs> whenever we are using any means of communication, we want to be very, very sure, first of all, that we're being heard first. So uh, I'm, I, I'm sure everybody is hearing me, right? Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah we are. Yeah. At, least those, at, at least those who can use their mic, I'm sure you, you guys can hear me. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, my name actually is. Do you want, do you to, want us to record this session? Record this session? <laughs> you can go ahead. If you want to record it, there's no problem. You can go ahead and record it. There's nothing. Uh, basically, what we'll be dealing with today is an open secret. So it's not something that is so. Uh, so, uh, can you speak up, sir? Yes, I said I said you can go ahead for whoever who whoever want to record this, you can go ahead and record it. Somebody asks if it uh, if uh, she's free to record, so uh, you can go ahead and record, please. Okay, my guru. Okay, please, my guru. Before you continue, my brother, uh, I would like to welcome everybody once again. Uh, this is Yoruba Nation. Uh, room on the clubhouse. Uh, we have this and many more conversations uh, like this. Uh, I just thought, you know, like our our usual practice, uh, we start every day by playing our Yoruba national anthem. Uh, please just sit back and enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs>
so much, everybody, for uh, sitting back to uh, enjoy that. Uh, my brother, my guru, please go ahead. And please, everyone on the stage, uh, do not disrupt the stage. And that goes to myself as well. Other moderators, if I interject or interrupt, please move me to the audience. And that goes to everyone else, please. And right now, I'm going to have to, I think we already did uh, turn off the handraising uh, function. Uh, once our speakers are done, we are going to open that up so other people can come up to the stage and speak. Thank you so much for your understanding. Uh, my brother, please go ahead. Please, my brother, my guru, please unmute your mic and, and go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me all? We can we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. So basically, without wasting, without much ado, uh, we are actually going to be discussing the, the experience of uh, the people who are known as the middle belt. Of Nigeria I'm gonna be talking from my own perspective just like any other the situation uh, with the middle belt and is just like any other uh, uh, marginalization being experienced by other people in this country including the, the the supposed major ethnic groups in Nigeria that's including the Igbos and the Yorubas excluding the house of Fulani because they are they are actually uh, the ones doing this marginalization so uh, the middle belt first of all I must clarify what constitute the middle belt and I would also want to encourage you that after this go back to the Nigerian map and look and check it out you will see that is not actually a disorganized region, it's actually a coordinated region that actually is in the middle of Nigeria. So what is regarded as the middle belt starts from Southern KB and ends at Southern Boru. So if you look at the map, if you look at your Nigerian map, when you carve out Southern KB, Southern KB is a middle belt. What actually uh, uh, makes one qualified to be a middle belt are those people who are not house of Fulani, but are domicile in where is now regarded as Northern Nigeria, but they are not house of Fulani. Now, if you look at these people, this people can you, can you, so we can hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Your voice is faint. Okay. Okay, let me try and see if I can get something to enhance my voice. Perhaps my phone is so... Sounds good to me, though. It's the signal of Mr. Bonka. Uh, we can hear you. We can hear Go him on. very well. Oh, uh, maybe I'm... The, okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, his voice is quite, oh, quite thank you. good. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, I was trying to describe the people who have been, uh, who are now, who have decided now to look for their identity and be called or be addressed as the middle belt instead of the house of Fulani. Now, these people, if you put them together, they constitute the majority in this country. I'm not talking about Tangali people because part of who are regarded as middle belt, there is Tangali, there is Biron, there is Steve, there is Idoma. All these people, if you put them together, they constitute the majority in this country. But they are the most marginalized in this country. Is this same people that the House of Fulani use? To present their population, uh, to present themselves as though they constitute a very, very high percentage of the population. 
it is when you put together, it is when you add the people who are now regarded as middle belt, that you have that population that most of you in the South now think is, is, is entirely Hausa Fulani. But it's not true. It's not true. We have lost our identity because of this Hausa Fulani oligarchies. We've lost our identities. We, don't, we are not known. And, uh, yesterday I was sharing with a friend of mine that you see, these middle belt people, we, we are the most backward set of people. We are not known for anything in this country. We've, we've not achieved educational uh, uh, excellence. We've not achieved uh, economic expertise. We are so backward. And I'm going to tell you the reason why we are backward. The problem, the, the sole problem of the middle belt, an average middle belt person, is his Christianity. His Christianity has destroyed has, has destroyed his uh, uh, self esteem. Christianity has destroyed his direction. It is only the middle belt that will suffer and be struggling to get promotion in his workplace, while he is actually the most qualified. You will see an institution. I will give you an example, a practical example with my dad. My dad actually. Is 75 years old now. He, he entered civil service with his degree. Ordinarily, a man who entered civil service during his time with his degree, you know now there is nothing that should stop somebody like that from retiring as a permanent secretary. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you today, my dad retired at level 14 after serving 35 years in civil service. And do you know what my dad, at the end of the day, end up saying? He said that it's his love for Jesus Christ that made people victimize him. And that is the average middle belter. He will surrender everything to Jesus. Anything happened to him, he will say, Jesus. Something is happening, you say, we will pray. We find it difficult to confront issues frontally. Whatever happened to us, religion now automatically diminish us so we have lost our sense of direction from a, 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 from doing or getting what is due to us in this country as a result of some of these things i'm highlighting and now the house of fulani very smart guys they have now realized that these people who most of the time are the most intelligent in the society, you will see that this is an average middle belt and that will go to school. Wherever you see middle belt, for instance, I will give an example with Gombe, where I come from. Southern Gombe, Southern Gombe constitute the highest number of most educated people from Gombe State. Almost every house there, you will see a professor, you will see a lawyer. But they are the most backward economic, anything that happened to them, you will not hear it. For instance, a couple of months ago, about two, two months, a village in my place, not very far from my village, was invaded. And the whole village, the whole village, was crushed everybody in just 12 hours of attack they cleared the village the whole village was cleared and you see it's not a, it's not because the people in the village are not so privileged one of the 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 the, 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 the former deputy governor of gombe state comes from that village the former Chief Judge of Gombe State, who served as the as the longest serving Chief Judge in Nigeria, he served 21 years as a Chief Judge in Nigeria. He's from that village. The, the immediate past Secretary to the Government of Gombe State is from that village. And we have other people who have grown in their little space of endeavors from that place. 
but their village was cleared. I'm not talking about 10 years, 20 years ago. This thing is not up to two months ago. But most of you are not even aware. It will not happen like it, something like this will not happen in Kano and you will not hear it. It's not possible. But my people will say that, oh, uh, we will go and pray about it. We pray about everything. Christianity that is supposed to actually help us, if you understand it very well, it has become a problem for us. Now, because of this, as I was trying to, I was trying to explain how the House of Fulani have decided to use this obvious weakness of the Middle Beltans to their advantage. The Fulani man knows that he can ride on an average Middle Beltan and nothing will happen. And that's what they've been doing. That's exactly what they've been doing. In January this year, I'm a Tangali man from Bindiri. Our king, who we now who we call the Mai, died. Mai Tangle died, and it was time to get a new uh, king. The Tangale people have a tradition of democratically electing their mice. I don't want to go into long stories, but an election was conducted and a winner emerged. But the governor has decided that he is not going to he is not going to allow the winner to take the throne because of religious, because of religion sentiments. And as I'm talking to you, the governor has appointed somebody other than the winner, a clear winner in that election. At the end of the day, things, some things happened and then our people said no. They rejected the whole thing, came out, protest. In the course of the protest, the protest was hijacked and eventually there was a bit of a crisis, it, it, it turned out to be violent. Two mocks were burned in Bilderi town. And the next day, it was all over Twitter, justice for Bilderi Muslims. The issue now turned from a traditional issue to a religious issue. And this, with, with due respect to those of us who are Muslims. The Muslims, uh, the, 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 the political elites in Nigeria, especially in the north, now they use they use uh, ethnicity when they are talking about the entire country, and they now use religion when it is a northern issue. Within the north, it is religion they use to force themselves and they accepted by uh, the southerners we're also finding it difficult who we have something in common most of it majorly religion in common with the southerners but they, they still consider us no you people are the same thing and the same thing in the north they, no 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 you people are not with us you people are uh, whatever it is they will call us some of the things you people will not understand is in Hausa it can be properly described in Hausa. Arne. Arne. <laughs> okay, one of us will know it. <laughs> they call us Arne, all sort of names. So, you see, uh, that is the situation of the Hausa full of women. I was discussing with a friend of mine the other day. And then he's telling me how evil people will go and then they will leave us. I said, see, my brother, if this country, if the if uh, Biafra should go, it's not only Biafra that will go. This country will divide into several parts. You will not even believe it. Because me, eh, if at the end of the day, my brothers, the Middle Beltans, will not come together and 
uh, and get ourselves out of the bondage we've suffered for a very long time. This my small village. I will go and look for independence for that my small village because I will not stay with Fulani people. They will destroy us. They will destroy us. Right now, our governor has arrested more than 30 people just because he want to crush the entire place because we have refused to accept his own king who lost at the election and who is a Muslim. But you see, the issue was not a Muslim Christian issue from the beginning. The issue, now I'm going to the main issue now. The issue in Nigeria is that of injustice. That is the issue. Whatever it is, you will call it. Whatever reason they are giving it. Under whatever pretense they are trying to create it. The issue is that of injustice by the ruling class. And I assure you, you see this religion, this ethnicity, all these sentiments that we ordinary people share or use it to fight ourselves. They don't have it amongst themselves. They don't have it. I'm not going to mention name, but I have been in the forefront for the fight against the marginalization and the injustice with respect to the issue of who becomes the chief judge of Gombe State after the retirement of that person I mentioned who, uh, who retired as the longest serving CJ in Nigeria. After he retired, the most senior is a woman who is from my place and is a Christian. But right now, the person, a governor in Nigeria, who is helping a, a, my governor to ensure that they get rid of that woman once and for all. It's a southern governor who is a Christian. So the day, the day they came up with a letter to crush her, a security report to crush her completely for, from being considered as the CG. I, 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 I told my boss that, you see, this country is finished. I said, we are finished in this country. And I said, Southern people don't have the right to speak against Northern leaders. They only speak about it or speak against it when it is convenient. It is a Southern governor that is helping and, 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 and one, uh, something I, I, I would want you to know is that they don't even belong to the same party. In principle, this one is APC, the other one is PDP. But it is his brother governor that is helping him to get rid of a woman who actually merits the CJ position because they belong to the same class. So it's a class issue in this country. And whatever it is, whatever Northern leaders have done, whatever Northern leaders have done to destroy this country, trust me, they have the support of Southern, of Southerners most of the time. And I'm telling you, the panel that is considering that woman or considered the security report, most of them in that panel are Southerners. I don't want to call their names. They are Southerners. So whenever the Northern, uh, the, 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 the Northern leaders want to do their dirty job, they look for somebody who look like your brother. They will send him against you. He will destroy you. So when you come to, uh, to complain to one of them, they say, ah, but you see, uh, who are the people in that panel? They will look at the names, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. But this is your brother now. You people attend the same church. Why will he do something like this? They send, their, uh, they send your people to destroy you. And that is how this country has been destroyed. It's an, it's an issue of interest. It's an issue of interest. The Hausa Fulani 
have the support, massive support of the southern leaders. Without their support, things wouldn't have been this bad. It's the support they've gained that has gotten this country where it is today. I can go on and on and on discussing this issue. In fact, from what I have said so far, I have left a lot of issues without even properly addressing them. Why? Because the issues are so much. The issues are so much. The, marginaliz the marginalization. You cannot, you cannot finish discussing the, the damage that the ruling, this ruling class have done to this country. And at the end of the day, when, whenever a discussion of this nature is going on, at the end of the day, we also try to convince ourselves, at the end of the day, after we finish ranting, after we finish discussing the issue, then we will now convince ourselves that there is nothing we can do about it, then we will go to bed, depressed. But uh, uh, I want to tell you people that there is something we can do about it. There is something we can do about it. Whatever it is, people want you to believe. I, me, I want, to lie. I want you to know that there is something we can do about it. And it, it happened. It's not something that is strange. It's not something that is rocket science. Or it's not something that has not happened before in this country. It was the people of Nigeria that removed President Goodluck Jonathan. It was the people of Nigeria. Whatever it is you are going to tell me is the people of Nigeria. The president, the president has enormous power to crush people only when the people allow it. There is no government, no matter how wicked. There is no government, no matter how wicked, that will come out and crush and be killing its citizen or and kill. 10 million people. And that was the reason why even after they killed some people at Lake Toge, they denied. Because they know they cannot do it. There is no, go no government that, will, that can do that. So I want to encourage us that we should have uh, uh, we should re-strategize. Lately, there has been protests here and there. Protest is not going to, that's, it's not the way. If it is the way out, then we would have, the, 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 the simple way they can uh, 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 destroy or spoil or scatter the place, is just get, go to one coral, get uh, people that smoke Igbo there, pay them 55k, which 55k, 11k. They will come and scatter the place, and they will say it's, it's that storm violence. The next thing you will see policemen, military men, and then at the end of the day, the whole thing has. So, protest is not the way out, obviously. We must re strategize and we must be organized in what we do. I want you to know, as a Yoruba man, that what you, Yoruba man, you are going through. Me, I want to I'm going through the same thing. Probably worse than what you are going to, through. Because in your own case, you can, you can make noise about it and people will listen to you and people will look at you. In my own case, I will make noise about it and nobody will hear me. That's the reason why Newar village can be destroyed and, and nobody will know. So we must understand that being violent in our approach may not give us the desired result. So we must re-strategize. And I hope that by the end of this discussion, we will come up with workable strategies on how to solve this problem. I have I have attended at least 10 of similar conversations today, just today, on this issue. 
that tells you that there is serious problem there is serious problem and we need to organize when we organize for the first time if we organize the same way we organize the same way we became united i am not a fan of all this let's unite let's unite no you know we've been looking at this unity issue the wrong way it's impossible for us to be united it's impossible on all issues that we are united no we must identify an issue that we can be united around but don't tell me that we should unite let us leave our differences and be united against the problem of this country i have a problem that my identity is is fading the Igbo man has a problem the Igbo man accidentally ruled this country for six months and since then we've not seen the Igbo man on this face i think that is injustice i don't think that the Igbo man is regarded by especially my northern house full and brothers as a nigerian because they have denied him times and times again the opportunity to lead this country from the front so it means that i have a problem the problem i have may not be leading this country from the front but the problem the Igbo man has is leading this country from the front and the same the same person that is marginalizing me is the same person marginalizing the woman. So we may not be united as regards the issues that are bothering us, but we can be we can unite against that enemy that has plagued us for a very long time. So uh, we must understand and identify the problem. It's not so difficult to identify it and address the issue frontally. One of the uh, conversation, one of the platform that was discussing something similar today, uh, Mr. Dilly was there, and he said that uh, secession is not. Uh, there is no any legal framework for secession in Nigeria. And as a lawyer, I want to confirm to you, I want to confirm to all of you that it's true. There is no legal framework for secession. But we can uh, we can restructure this country. United States of America consists of many countries in the states is a it's a confederate system that is why each state has its own laws each state has its own supreme court each state has its own senate it's 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 because it's a confederate we can have something like that but we must know we must be conscious we must understand what we are going through and it is some of us who are privileged to have a, 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 a level of education that will carry the ones who don't know. It is my participation in some of these things of late that exposed me to the fact that the things that you think everybody knows, most people don't know something very elementary people don't know what is the greatest weapon that the house of full and are using against us the middle class are using against nigeria it is our ignorance our ignorance is the greatest weapon in their hands they don't want you to speak out and they don't want those people who don't know to know. That is the greatest weapon. 
So we must work towards giving our people the desired education and understanding and enlightenment with respect to these issues. Only when we only when our people are informed, we can make meaningful progress. The highest injustice you can do to a man is to deprive him of information. When you don't know, lack of information is like darkness. We must work towards doing something that let us not just shout for the fun of it. Let us not let us not always be crying. Let us start working out solutions. The same thing, uh, the, the, the problem is the same everywhere. We must address Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, my brother, my guru. Uh, Thank you for that insight. Uh, I'm going to call Shama, and after Shama, I'm going to call Patience. Shama, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Yep, we can hear you. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Evening, morning, afternoon. Please speak louder, uh, please. Hello, Shama? Yeah, is my audio okay better now? No, that's better. Thank you. Oh, all right, all right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I'm from Southern Kaduna, so I think I'd um, like to talk a bit about what's going on in Kaduna. And from what um, Mr. Meguro has been saying, I've seen a link between what is happening in Southern Kaduna and what's happening in his own home state. I see a pattern, like the approach is, is quite similar. I remember him saying um, they use people that are from your own religion, your own tribe to oppress you. That, that's the same thing that has been going on in Kaduna State. The commissioner for internal security in Kaduna State is from Southern Kaduna. He was in the first tenure of Elufa, he was his media aide. Then coming to the second tenure, I was made commissioner for internal security. So once there's crisis in Southern Kaduna, you see his convoy going down there and he's one that comes and downplays what's going on. Uh, he makes it look like uh, what people are saying is not, is not it. There's one particular place, I mean, um, in, in the first part, half of LFI's gov, um, government, um, well, up to now, it's actually still going on in Kajuru, Kajuru local government. The local government chairman, in fact, I, I, I consider him a very foolish person. He's a young man, a young man, is, and he's in that position. But what this guy does is, he leaves his constituency, he leaves Kajuru and he's inside Kaduna town since it's not five, like 40 minutes drive. He spends most of his time inside Kaduna. You go, he goes and sit down in the bar and puts his phone on flight mode. So even when something is going on in his coming in his constituency, he doesn't know about it. He's you are trying to reach him, you cannot reach him. Then by the time he goes back there, he just tells you um it did not happen. Or it's not the way they are saying it, they are trying to give it. A religious um, undertone. So it just goes to show that we have problem from even amongst amongst us. Uh, I remember the the issue of Namdekanu and the, the likes. I I was telling people some of my book friends. I said the main problem that you people are having is not even the federal government. It's your own leaders. Namdekanu came up and said, okay, this is what he's fighting for. And there was no nobody in the political sphere that was there to support him or even to offer guidance. So he just left him on, on his own. One of the most powerful commissioners in Kaduna State is also a Southern, um, someone from Southern Kaduna. But it is the same issue. They don't talk. In fact, that you don't even have access to them. Those that were in, those in the Senate, I, don't, I can't remember 
seen the Senator representing Kaduna South Senatorial District. I can't remember hearing him talk on the floor about what is happening. Maybe he has, but I cannot remember. So it's just that you see that, apart from the fact that they are oppressors, amongst your own people, you have people that that are that are beneficiaries of what is happening, not directly beneficiary of the crisis, but I mean their pocket is getting filled up, so they will not say anything, regardless of how many people are dying or how many people are being displaced. They are making money. Um, so Kapu is a is a is an organization that represents Southern Kaduna as a whole, all the tribes in Southern Kaduna. So Kapu, the Sokapu president, president will come on national TV and be ranting. But after ranting, what does he do? He does nothing. The last time we had a, a meeting with with them regarding um, a particular project that we felt could help reduce some of the, pro the problems there, he was not buying the idea at all. He said, no, it's not going to work. He, he he was not open to understanding where we are coming from. He just didn't just want to hear it. Why why would he why why was he behaving that way? When crisis happened, aid aid money sent down, and this money is being controlled by him. I I knew him to be to be a very greedy and stingy fellow. So money comes in and he sits on the money and shares the money amongst his cronies. So they are satisfied with the money coming in. It's more of an opportunity. So all they have to do is come on TV and, and shout they are killing his people. Then people send funds and you don't see it. I, I think in December there was an attack. Yeah, December 2020, there was an attack in a community called um, Gangora in the local government. And I was in Zonko at the time. So I woke up in the morning and I saw these people that were displaced. I think it was either on Christmas, there were a few days before Christmas. I saw this people and I was, I went to get something nearby. I was walking back and tears were rolling down my cheek. Like, you are seeing children, they are just moving with their, the mothers and children moving about. Any shop they see, they'll just stop. Anything you have, give us. So people are buying noodles, anything they, they could afford, we're buying and giving it to them. But what I, the information I now got from my cousin, he told me that the people that, where they are responsible for feeding these displaced people now, these IDPs, that they are living large. The last time they were displaced and they came here, that those people were living large. They were spending money recklessly because money is given to them to provide food, to provide um, basic amenities to these people, which they don't do. They divert the funds for their personal use. And when I say personal use, not that they haven't done anything business with money. Basically, it's just to go and drink and follow women up and down. So you see that the, the problem is, of course, there's problem from the top, but there is problem even at our own level. We are not in government, but the, the, there is there is just this selfishness that we have amongst ourselves that is making this thing to thrive. Now, uh, when 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 we when you look at the Christians in the north, there's a large population of Christians in the north, but many people do not know that don't know that those. In the south, south, south is some of them don't know. They just assume everybody in the north is a Hausa or a Fulani person and a Muslim until maybe they come for service or they interact with people from the north. Well, thank God for, for the internet now and social media. I've seen, in fact, I, I was speaking to someone, he's a pastor with the Baptist Convention. I met him in Katina, so we, I was talking about his church. He told me that he was. Station in Katina, I was in Bakuri local government. So I said, okay, I know Bakuri has Christians. I said, how many um, Baptist churches do you have there? And he told me they have 18 Baptist churches, 18 Baptist churches within Bakuri local government alone. I said, are you telling me 18 in the whole of Katina state? He said, no, Bakuri, they have 18 different locations. And the same thing happens when you go to places like Fun. So I go to places like Hafer with places like Malonfashi, large Muslim um, Christian communities, but they are not represented. As a Christian, a Katsina man, as a Christian, you cannot even win election. Ordinary councillorship, nobody is going to give you that position. So the political domination has created this image that the North is something it is not. 
when you look at Kaduna State, Southern Kaduna, predominantly Christian, though we have pockets of um, indigenous Muslims, but it's predominantly Christian. But when you go down to places like the new local government, it's, there are lots of Christians. They go to Makarifi, lots of Christians. And But the, the image is that Kaduna State is a Hausa state. It's considered to be a Hausa state because the governor, okay, now we even have a, 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 a Muslim governor and deputy governor, which is something they might decide to even go ahead and try again by 2023. So politically, we are dominated. I, I believe Gombe State is not, might be split 50-50 when we look at Christian and Muslim population I mean, at, and states like Bauchi. So the whole idea behind this is we have to get united and have one voice. If not, the crisis is not going to end. I'm, I'm actually getting tired of always talking about, about this killings going on every day which is not even on mainstream media it happens every single day in my own village my village we're having a funeral well, i was not there there was a funeral and it was an old person so you know there's this kind of celebration that goes with it in the night towards evening next thing people came in with guns and started shooting i think about three people were killed so it's 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 going it's the, the level is, is just too much. I, I was with someone yesterday here in Kaduna town. He's a medical doctor. He had to leave his house. His house is somewhere in a place called Nisi village. But kidnappers came to the area recently and abducted people. He had to pack his family out of his own house to go and rent an apartment somewhere else where he feels he's a bit safer. So are we going to keep moving? Well, if, if you move from Nisi village and move to Mahuta, because you feel it's safer. When they come to Mota, where will you move to? You move to Bernawa. I mean, there was an attack um, sometime last year or early this year in in a place called Meguro, which is inside the, inside the town here where you assume if they attack, there's nowhere to escape. But they came in, did what they wanted to do, and they left. So the government in the state is, is, is nonchalant to what was happening. There was a hike in school fees in the state university here, Kasu, and there was protest and all. In fact, they released um, um, forms to parents to sign that if any of their awards should protest against the hike in school fees, they would be expelled without warning. So the people should not talk. These are the same parents that some of them have lo lost their houses because El Fire is demolition to build road without getting any reasonable compensation. Some of them have lost their jobs because El Fire is trying to reduce the size of the civil service. Then you are now raising the school fees. How are these parents supposed to pay? I know of a, of a family that have that experienced this whole thing. The man lost his job, then the school fees was raised. Next thing the notification came that they are coming to demolish the house. And they just give you a short window, like within, you might be giving maybe two or three weeks notice that we are coming to demolish your house. How, where do you move to? So this is, so these are, the, these are the challenges we are having. Then when you, when there was a hike in the school fees in, government um, in in the College of Education, Gideon Wire, students went out to protest. These students were greeted with guns. I think three people lost their lives that day because they were protesting a hike in school fees. So, and the governor does not take responsibility. He's quiet about it. He tells you it, it, there is nothing he can do about it. He took his, his child to a public school then. <clears throat> But gradually, quietly, he removed him from the school. I know where the, the school where the child is now. When you when you are passing, you will see the security presence. You know that okay, something is going on here. There is heavy security presence in the place. He's protecting his child. But who protects the child of the masses? Who protects ordinary citizens? When people are telling you they don't move about again because they are afraid of kidnappers, I told them live your life the way you should because whether you hide in your house or you go out if they are coming for you they will come they will come and meet you in your house so the only the only 
where you can guarantee your safety now is by prayers. We pray to the God of Israel to protect us. Even Israel don't don't depend on on the, on 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 God that much, but we have no other option. That's the only thing we have to fall back on. Uh, it's 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 a this evening i was coming in from town and i was seeing cows everywhere at, at some point I was, I was complaining why are there cows everywhere um Goningo, abuja junction i saw a herd of cows coming towards pojo i saw cows i was like what's happening and this is evening 7 p.m and there are cows everywhere in the same society we should not be looking for space sharing space with cows on the road Motorists will have to wait for cows to finish crossing before they can move. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, when the, we hear the phrase house of line, house of line, the funny thing is that the house of people and the flying people are two different people. There is really no such thing technically as house of line. They are not together, they are different. They don't, in most cases, they don't like, they don't even like intermarrying. When you, if you say, if your house of man wants to marry a flying person, there's all these issues like no, we don't want it. You have to marry a flying person or house to house. But they use that name, house of flying, to present the picture that they are bigger than what they are and achieve their political goals. But then when you now look at the people that are supposed to oh um this guy, um Mr. Meguru made it. My, my brother Shama. My brother Sherman, yes, can you please wrap up in two minutes? Thank you. All right, sir. Yeah. Um, Mr. James said something about the problem of middle belt as being religion. To an extent, it's actually a problem because I know that there are times you talk to people here, and when you when you when you are trying to prefer solutions, the only thing you hear from our parents and our uncles is ah, the only thing to do is to pray. Only God can save us. But God has given, there's a place for prayer and there's a place for action. My brother. Uh, so I okay. think it's very important that unites as a people, yeah. All right, thank you so much, uh, my brother yeah. Sharma. Uh, I wanted to call patients to go next, but uh, Dr. Mo is also from Southern Kaduna, so I'm going to give you 10 minutes, Dr. Mo, between five to 10 minutes, actually. Please uh, also speak to uh, what Shama uh, has just said, and you know, then patients can go after that. Five to 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, Bami, sorry, Dr. Mo. Uh, I think patient is in Nigeria and it might be late because she might want to go to school, to, uh, go to work tomorrow. So I'll um, suggest that she goes, then Dr. Mo can go after her, thank you. All right. Uh, I just wanted us to have uh, Southern Kaduna perspective together. But anyways, uh, patience, please go ahead. Sorry about that. My sister, patience. Maybe she already slept even. Okay, Dr. Mo, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Hi, patience sir. is Go, go ahead, patients. Okay, hi, good evening. All right, I'm, I'm actually from Kogi State. So that's um, in the middle bed, and I've been opportune to um, live in Joss, um, Makodi, that Benue State, which are all um, middle belt and uh, states. I think the major problem we have in the middle belt is not even the religion. Um, too much diversity in the middle belt. They say Nigeria has about 250 ethnic groups. I'm sure more than half of those ethnic groups, or even three over four of them, are in the middle belt. Take Plateau State, for instance. You get to every local government in Plateau State, and there's a different language. And there's division in those, within those um, languages. So there's no unity in the middle belt. Um, for us to come together to be a force against um, maybe the northern Atta, it's, it's going to be very tough. In Kogi state, it's either you're saying, okay, I'm Igala or I'm Ibira or I'm Basange. There's a part of um, Igal and um, Kogi state that speaks Yoruba, but they don't even affiliate themselves with the Yorubas. So that's the issue 
with the middle belt. The division is so much, and this has made us not to have an identity. In the middle belt, you come and then we're speaking Hausa as our language. We want to communicate generally. You're speaking Hausa. So you're lost. And you're speaking Hausa. You're not accepted by the core northerners. And then you're trying we, to have their identity when they don't recognize you. So these are like the issues we have. I even think that our Christianity is just one of the factors that actually even binds us together. If you take out that Christianity that we but because okay, when you come, so oh, you're a Christian and everything that brings us together. But when you take that out, it's a whole lot of division. And then there's fights here. This local government is fighting each other. You bring in a governor, a governor does road to only his place. Then the other people are fighting. So how can the middle bear say, okay, we're producing one person to go maybe on the national level to fight for us. I don't see that ever happening in this country. It, it won't happen. The middle belt is too divided. The only thing is, if Nigeria ever happens to divide, we'll just find a place to um, bind ourselves. The good thing is the river Niger, or no, the rivers in Nigeria actually like geographically divided us out of the north. So if Nigeria has to separate someday, we'll probably find ourselves in the south. But before then, we need to actually find leaders, people that um, we can put forth to fight and give us an identity. Apart from David Mark, who was one time Senate president, I don't remember anybody in the North, in the Middle Belt, actually holding power, which actually still comes to that division. Even the David Mark, the, the only development he brought to his place is, is the road in front of his house. He takes a helicopter to Benue State, and then from there, he just drives into his house. There's no development. Nobody in Benue State can say, oh, this is what David Mark did. He was, he's the longest serving senator, and then he was sen a Senate president for how many terms? But the North, what they have is unity. They are too united in the North. You can't break them. The religion, the language they speak binds them together. I live in Lagos. The moment you see a house man and you just greet him, ah, that's all. He has seen a brother. But you go to an office and you, you, you say, oh, I'm Biram. And then the person that is there, that is Karok, is looking at you like, I don't know you. So that's something that we need. I don't know if it's something that we need to teach our children or growing up. I don't know how we can send that message out. The middle belt needs to have an identity. And we need to be united and stop discriminating. Okay, this person is from here. Even in the same local government, you see somebody who say, oh, I'm from this part of this local government. I'm from this part of this local government. But you go to the north, Fulani Hausa, like somebody said, there are not even so many. But because they come together and say, oh, we're Hausa Fulani, it now looks like there are so many of them. And that's unity. That's what unity does to you as a country. If your people cannot come together with one voice to say, oh, this, 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 and that, see what is happening in, in um, Kaduna. Because there's division, oh, this one say I'm Northern Kaduna, oh, I'm Southern Kaduna. Whatever happens to Southern Kaduna, the people in Northern Kaduna don't care. That's Southern Kaduna, there are so many languages, Kagoro, Chip, um, I don't know, there are so many languages. That, so there's still that division. We need to come together as a, they say, um, like a broom, you, the broom is stronger as, can you guys hear me? Yes, please. Loud and clear. Okay. okay, good. So we're supposed to come together as a broom. You can break a stick of broom, but you cannot break a bunch of broom. And that's why we don't place anywhere in the society. You go to parastatals, they are hardly top officials of those parastatals that are middle belters, hardly. I don't remember any Igala man or, and even if an Igala man gets there, they'll use Juju and kill him. That's what we do. So I don't know the, the unit, I, I, I don't know when or how the unit and the middle belt is going to be united. It's going to be a tough job. We only pray that we don't get lost in the whole madness that is happening in the country because nobody cares about us. The South doesn't care about us. The North doesn't care about us. Even we, the middle belters, don't care about each other. Please so wrap up in a minute, please. Yeah, it's really, I think that's just all I have to say. And I hope we get it right someday and then we're able to grow from wherever we are. As a, all right. 
Thank you so much, my sister. Uh, I just want to say that we care about you guys in, in the middle belt, belt and part of Nigeria. And that is why we're, we're giving you guys this platform to speak up so people can understand where you are all coming from. Uh, no, I'll just go to Dr. Mo and uh, please between five to 10 minutes, Dr. Mo. Dr. Mo, please go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, there is so much to unpack, but I, I don't think we will have the luxury of time to look at a few things um, here. Um, but what I would say is the fact that um, the killings are still going on. Uh, so the last 72 hours, there's still so much killing and um, the data are there. Uh, essentially, just to make it clear, I am not... I'm, I'm from Bainway, but I'm born and bred in Kaduna. I grew up in Kaduna. I schooled in Kaduna. I schooled in both Katsina State and in Kaduna. So all my life has been Kaduna, essentially, if not because of the um, the madness and contraption that we have as Nigeria, I should be able to run for the governor of Kaduna State. But even when I had to go into politics, they pointed me to, to Bainway, where I only went as a result of burial. I don't really, really know anything about that. I had to go there and start learning language of the people, but it's also part of the backdrop of what we're talking here today. The major concern is, um, I believe we would have um, a proper time where we can really look at that. And I want to appreciate the Yoruba nation because there is a group, there is a middle belt republic group, even on, on, um, on um, what's it called, on Clubhouse. And then you really can see how divided it is. When you set it up, the middle belt people because essentially they have been like a conquered people and they operate in that. But gradually, I think we're synergizing and we're waking up to be able to have a common front. And the reason why we haven't even divided as a nation is because the middle world people who are essentially the belt that are within this um, geopolitical zone and um, geographical zone are the ones really holding up why this country hasn't gone off them. If if anything, uh, if there's a synergy, the way the Igbo people are, the Yoruba people are, if the Middle Belt could come together like that, I can assure you by now we wouldn't have a nation. But because that hasn't happened, and the reason why that hasn't happened is because of the too many languages that that um, ethnic groups that are bordered around this um, this this belt, you know. But it's important for me to just state here the fact that the killings are still going on. You know, uh, I gave a report just a few hours ago in certain platform where I said that about 215 houses were raised to the ground in Southern Kaduna, 33 people were killed. And you know, and it's, as we're talking right now, people are in fear. I was trying to get people like Ido Mekori and Alheri, who is the daughter of the chief of Adara that was uh, imprisoned by Erufai um, for almost, um, or there for almost uh, 90 days before they were released. Uh, we will create a platform where they can come here because Part of the work that I'm doing, I work closely with the, the, the former bishop in Southern Kaduna. He's called Bishop Bogobri. Shortly before he died, I also work with Major Asaki. These are part of the people who were working sincerely and working hard on the under Sokapo. I work with them directly. You know, unfortunately, these two people are not here anymore. How they died were very mysterious and they keep killing the people. That's why people like Aud Mekori are not there anymore. I recounted my story a few weeks ago or days ago where I spoke about how in Lemu Road, for those of us who know Kakuri area, you know, going to the Equa Church, I mean, that was about what, maybe 15 or 14 or 15, where we came into the church and the pastor was hacked into bits in church. And that was my first encounter with um, just seeing dead bodies littered all around in the church, you know, and this is our reality. You know, the killings have continued. They've continued to use all kinds of means, you know, um, and like I mentioned, like um, the other speaker was talking about, it will be very difficult since the existence of um, Kaduna as a state. Uh, it was a mistake that Yakua became um, what the, the governor, and that was because um, um, was the Namaji Sambo had to go and vice uh, uh, GEJ, and even at that, he was still killed. You know, to show the level of madness that these people are on, they are not going to stop until they, they make sure that the empty Southern Kaduna completely is a, is, is a, is a pogrom that is going on, you know? 
This is complete madness that is going on. Every other thing that we're talking about, can it be stopped? Yes, it can be stopped, but it can never be stopped without the support of the Southern people. And this is why it's important for us to be in platform like this, to tell you exactly what is happening. As we're speaking right now, people are there. I mean, the you're, you're talking about, it's the, the, I don't even blame the people. Yeah, I mean, they have their e internal crisis and all of that where they carry money. Even the, the people that are they're, they're giving the money to help the the, the IDP camps, even they themselves, look at them. These are people that cannot even move by themselves. You know, if so that money that you are giving to them, you know, poverty, the, it's been weaponized to the point that the whole place has been has been completely weaponized by poverty, that you can't even be blaming the people that are carrying the money because even they themselves, they need to survive. Major Sake could not, a major general in the Nigerian army, before he died, he could not even buy fuel from Kaduna to come to Abuja. And then you give that kind of person money to give to the, 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 the to, 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 to the children in the IDPs. That's the kind of poverty that is going on there. But yes, side by side, you could see what, what, what the former GMD was doing with all the money he has. And, I, and you know, and, and sadly so, you know, but I see that, but essentially, the killings haven't stopped. Even if you weaponize the people with poverty, but why killing them? Why remove them, removing them from their ancestral land? Why decimating them? You know? And for me, that is the core. What, what do we have to do as a house? What voice do we have to do? Because first things first, before you can even talk about giving them a livelihood or anything, the killings have to stop. They are still killing them in Southern Kaduna. The killings haven't stopped. And uh, there, is, there is nothing more I can say. What do we need to do to stop the killing? Because any historical background or anything I'm going to say right now will make no meaning until the killings can stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my brother, Dosh, please go ahead. Dosh. Uh, just got, uh, okay, I can go ahead um, uh, and speak. I think um, there's so much that I have gotten from this this conversation that we're having. The first one is basically that the harpies, and you see that's why it's so important that we had that um, th we, we had that clubhouse group uh, the other day where we talked about the the harpies amongst us making reference to um, a lot of people, the enemy within, where you have a lot of, of internal people that you cannot trust and that will betray you and all that. It's part of what we're going through in the middle belt. We have to be really, we need to have strategic um, um, reactions. We have to have um, strategies in place to curb issues like that, like this, because they're definitely going to use this elite against um, us in, in any movement that we start. Um, that's the first thing I, I, I drew out of what the past speaker said. And the second one is that the world needs to hear us. You see all these killings that are going on, nobody knows about them. And that's why this, these killings continue coming. I mean, they, they keep increasing because because nobody knows, nobody is hearing about this. We need to blow this up. We have killings in Igongon. Who's, are we blowing this up? Is the international um, people from other countries, are they, do they, are they aware about this? Even within our country, we have killings in the Middle Belt, Gombe, Plateau, Kadun. What are we doing? We need to set up channels to blow this up, photos. Because this thing, we, we don't even value human life at the moment. This thing needs to go mainstream. That's what I took from this. The third thing I took from the past speakers is that if you keep running, they will still keep closing you up. In Kaduna, many people have relocated and they're still going to relocate and the killings will start. We see this in Joss. If you run, they will come. We, see, we have seen this in Joss. People are running from Joss not to Joss South. Is the killings not coming into Joss South now? Will you stay and fight? They would, they would, will you, if they take you to the sea, will you, will, you don't have anything. They would drown you out. You have to stay and fight. Protect what's, what, what has been your ancestors fought for and gave you. 
or else you will be slaves. That's what I'm taking from these from these stories that these past speakers are talking about. Another thing I took about from this that everybody has agreed here is this religion that we use. Other ethnic groups like the Fulanis have been able to use their ethnicity and their religion to conquer so many people. What are you using your religion for? You just go to church and they kill you and you sit back and pray and say God will help you? If you are using your religion and you are not using and, and, and you cannot use it well, switch to something that, that can help you. Let me tell you, the Middle Belt has a history of fending up Fulani invaders. They use the traditional religion. This has helped them for centuries. If you're Christianity, you cannot use it, throw it away and use something else. We in the Middle Belt have not been able to use our openness. We have not been able to use our religion. In fact, it has become a burden and a weakness to us. So this is a warning to the South. Your progressiveness, your openness, your religion, how are you using that to protect yourself? If you're using it wrong and you're getting killed for it, drop that thing. Pick, some, pick something that will help you. Your ancestors fought using the traditional method. If Islam is not helping you, look, I was in Jaws when Yoruba Muslims were massacred. Of what use is your Islam if you're getting massacred and you share the same religion with these people? Come on, are we kidding ourselves? The Christians in Kaduna are getting massacred. I was in Jaws, we're, we're, we're in church and people are praying. You're praying and people are dying. Look, let's not kid ourselves. How many reconciliatory efforts have been put in place? You remember the, the uh, Fibersima uh, Judicial Com uh, Commission of Inquiry in 1994? Nikitobi Judicial Commission of Inquiry in September 2010. There was the Presidential Peace Initiative Committee in Plateau, 2004 to 2010. The JTF and the army have been dis deployed. Yet people, you heard Mela, his village was crushed just two months back. Do you want them to set up a peace and re reconciliatory committee for you in the South before your eyes open? They, it, they will set it up and the killings will still not stop. They will deploy the army and, the, and, and JTF and you will get killed there. Let me tell you something. If you look at Basa local government in Plateau State, there's a barrack not far from there. That community was crushed. You think staying close to a barrack will save you? They will come in the night and dis destroy you and the, and, and the army will still tell you that we, that we haven't gotten um, uh, orders to, to, to move out and protect that community. That is what is happening in the Middle Belt. If you go and look at the past videos, Governor Jan was crying. His people were killed. He as a governor is helpless. When people tell you, go and meet your local government chairman, go and meet uh, uh, your governor, go meet your senator, let me tell you, they will get tips that your villages and your communities are getting attacked and they're helpless. So what, do you, what will it take from you to learn from the lessons from the Middle Belt? That's the question that I have for every one of you. You're seeing what is happening in the Middle Belt? and you're still not learning. I don't know what it would take for you to learn. Let me tell you what, hap what, is, what the problem of the Middle Belt is. The problem of the Middle Belt is a settler versus indigenous problem. Let's look at Jaws. The problem started with the British. They set up, um, they, they set up the, the Fulani and Hausa elite during colonial times to, pro, to, to govern that region. Mind you, Plateau State was never conquered during Danfodio. So we don't have that. And that's why the, the, out of 17 local governments, we have close to 15, 16 that are Christian in Plateau State. 
but yet the British are the ones who caused it. So when you're running to the British, you're knocking on on on, on uh, whatever number nineteen Downing Street. Have in mind that these people are co-conspirators. They put the Fulani over that region. And let me tell you, immediately um, um, during 1912, they started building, uh, th there was mining in that region, and that was when the Hausa settled there. As early as when the Hausa settled there, they started, um, they elected their leader. It was till 1947 that people in Plateau State were able to get native leaders. That was when the, the traditional council was set up. And let me even tell you, the Hausa rejected that traditional council and set up theirs to govern themselves. And this is what will happen. We saw this in Igongong, where they set up their traditional rulership. He became even more powerful than, than the, the, the traditional ruler in Igongong. In fact, he was the one negotiating with bandits. We see this in Plateau State. If you let this, they will come and take over the, the traditional rulership in your communities, and they will negotiate with kidnappers. They will kidnap you, and he will become he, his power in, will increase. You're seeing these things happening in the middle belt, and your eyes are still not opening. I don't know what it will take. When you talk of restructuring, I just laugh. Restructuring how? Let me let me give an example of. The, the restructuring that has happened in the Middle Belt. The state creation, local government creations, to me, that is all hogwash. If you look at if you look at the way the way the IBB in nineteen ninety one, IBB cut out um, an entire local government for settlers. This restructuring you are saying your children will visit this restructuring in fifty years. Settlers in Oyo State will get local governments. Settlers in in uh, Oshun will get local government. Settlers in Abia will get local government. We see this in Kombe. We see this in Plateau. What will it take for you to learn from the Middle Belt? Most of the conversations I have with people, they have no idea with what is going on in the Middle Belt. They are clueless. Let me tell you, either you solve this issue now or your descendants will solve this issue. And it will be worse then. The lines will be more blurry at that point. Now, let's look at traditional rulership, like I said. When you look at places like Nasarawa, the Amias are even more powerful in that region. Let's look at Plateau State, the Amia of Wase. They have a whole house of rep seat for settlers. While in Plateau State, you have three, three local governments to produce one, one rep one uh, house of rep in, in Wase, the way they created it, just one settler can produce a house of rep member, and they don't care. When you say, ah, oh, but the but Plateau State is voting uh, with the North, it's because of the way they were created and, they, and settlers were giving house of rep uh, um, seats. They will give senators seats, they will give house of rep members seats if you don't act now. The Middle Belt has a history of fighting against oppression. If you look at Benue and and um, and Jukum communities from um, uh, Taraba and Benue State, in the 1700s they were they formed um, a collaboration to fend off Fulani invaders. It's recorded. You can go and check this. They use their traditional means. So when you sit with your Christianity and you sit with your Islam, and they're killing you. Just know that you're using your religion the wrong way. Even in the Bible, people defended themselves. Even in the Quran, people defended yourself. Why would you allow someone mistake your progressiveness and your openness for weakness? Let me tell you, in Plateau State, they kept attacking those communities till they stood up. If you look at between 1998 and 2004, there were 64 conflicts all political and then they turned religious there is all these conflicts you see have fulani hegemony linked with them to cause chaos when they don't get the political leadership that they want let's look at let's look at what it would what they have an almajiri program that is flooding 10 million children out of school what do you think those 10 million children will be in the next year if you don't run, 
Let me tell you how it will look like. In 1959, as far early as that, the United Middle Belt Congress was was for 1955, the, the United Middle Belt Congress. Was, by 1959, they held the elections. And the Middle Belt were able to elect democratic leaders. When these people tell you that they want democracy, they don't want democracy. They want to crush you. Why did the MPC back under Amadou Bello? Why did they reject that um, uh, native authority that was elected by the UMBC? Why did they move to crush the Middle Belt at that time. Wasn't it democratic at that time? You think they, they, they didn't allow democracy then, they will allow it now? Look at the amount of military dictatorships we've had. It points to a particular leadership style, if you don't get it. When you become minorities in this country, just get ready for that UMBC style. We've already saw it, we have, we have already seen, seen what is happening with the rejection of the electronic voting. How long will it take for your eyes to open? You have people negotiating with bandits. If I, if I, if I, if I do a, how many people are in this room right now? Let me check. There are 128 people. If I ask all of you who the bandit generals are, how many of, how many of you can tell me who they are? But you know Namdi Kano. You know Sunday Boho. You think that it's just a coincidence? Let me tell you, Ruga is just one of the, the methods. There are different methods to doing this. There's the illegal building that we see. Illegal buildings are going in, in, in Kaduna, in Laduga, happened. The one in Just Not is happening. The ones in your areas are happening very little by little, just that you don't know it yet. They start brick by brick building. When they make a community, they will elect a leader and then he becomes more powerful than your leader. We know these schemes. Yes, the Middle Belt has problems. Yes, we have problems with leadership. Yes, we have problems. Um, we, can't, we can't even sit in the same room with each other. But let me tell you what unites the Middle Belt. In the past, now we're struggling with that. But in the past, the Tiv and the Jukums and all these minority tribes, there's a reason why they, they, they were not, uh, they don't have a, a history of jihadist. Um, um, they were not conquered by the jihadists because they banded together to fight this. If we in the Middle Belt do not band up to fight this, we will be crushed. All these squabbles that I see on Clubhouse between the Yorubas, Trust me, we in the Middle Belt, we have more experience with squabbles. If you don't band together, you will be annihilated. The Igbos, this progressiveness, will it be your downfall? How long will it take for you to get the message? The message is loud and clear that the restructuring that is promised to you is feudal restructuring. You think that the restructuring you have in your mind is what will be given to you? The, the major issues here is land. We were in groups where um, Fulanis from Guinea said that no land is, is anybody's. Everybody came and met the land. When you meet a Fulani person, he tells you the century that your parents migrated. He will tell you, you moved here in the ninth century, you moved here in the seventh century. Isn't that what is happening? Open daily trust. You will see the Benue Valley, when Benue people came there. You will see the time they will say that um, um, Plateau people came to that land. Now it's happening with the Yorubas. They started to saying that the year they migrated. They don't think that land is, is owned by anybody. Land is free for all. For you, to save your land, you have to understand who you're dealing with. We all know the Polaco Code and what it stands for. Ethnic superiority. You are not dealing with someone who even views you like a human being. I want everybody in this house, in this group to go and check what the Polaco Code means. Let me even tell you, 
when you resist the tactics change the tactics never remain the same in plateau state most of the communities that were attacked in 98 to 2008 they were they were decimated and they stood up to fight what happened after then that was when bomb blast started happening i survived the bomb blast just by the whiskers I was going in, in, in the main market and then I said, with, I was going with my friend and then I just changed my mind and I, that I was hungry and I was going home. That was how I survived. And that's why I'm giving you that message. You think that these header attacks will be confined to header attacks? By the time you rise up, they will change to bomb blast or something else. When you hear of bomb blast in the middle belt, what do you think? It's because people have started arming themselves to resist. They switch the tactics. You have to be dynamic in your thought process and in your actions, or else more people will continue to die. Look at look at local governments like Bark and Ladi, like Shendam in Plateau State being decimated. Do you know how many IDP camps are in, are in the Middle Belt? Three million. And we're still praying in the Middle Belt, asking God. If you go to all our churches, People are seeing visions and praying while we're being killed. When I when I come on Clubhouse and I see people saying, you're calling for war, you're calling for war. Do not do not call for war. I went, aren't we at war? Almost 10 million internally displaced persons in 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 in, in, in Nigeria. There's a statistic that even Sudan that was fighting for 40 years has 2.5 2. million people. How long before you guys realize that we are in we are at war? Communities in, in, in Gombe are being crushed. Do you remember the Dogonahawa incident? Ratsat and Zot in Plateau State? You may not. They decimated, they crushed that village. Let me ask you, why is it that bandit attacks, uh, um, herder attacks somehow align with political motivations? There is a need to renegotiate this social contract. If we don't renegotiate this social contract, we will continue to die. Restructuring will not save you. They will restructure a new way to kill you. If you don't renegotiate the entire social contract, everything, if you restructure, what, what, how, what, what will you leave out the, the army's human rights abuses? Do you want us to go into that topic of, of the army killing people? We can go to that. We can go to the South South and see how the army is decimating people there. If you restructure, how do you restructure, reform the rules of, of engagement between the military and civilians? How do you re uh, renegotiate traditional rulership? Let me tell you, there's lack of faith with even the military. So isn't it the military and the police that will protect you? You know the problems that we're facing with the military. When I start talking about these problems, there are so many. There are so many. Let me tell you another issue. Another issue is marriage. If you look at the communities in Benue State that have intermarried with Fulani, there are three local governments, Gwe, Guma, and Makodi. If you come to Plateau State, you see there are Nagutas and there are Fizeris. They intermarried with the Fulanis. These are the most affected communities. Most of them have Fulani uh, relatives. Do you see the Fulanis opening groups to talk about the killings of those people. They don't, those half breeds, they don't even consider them as human beings. You think intermarrying, Yoruba intermarrying will save you? They will kill you. Just go and check these three local governments, if you think I'm lying, if they have intermarried or not. And then check other local governments like Vandekia, um, Oju in Benoit State and see if they intermarried too. This is an assignment. Go and check it if you think I'm lying. Check who has intermarried and who hasn't, and who is being killed. Your progressiveness is getting you killed. I listened to one, one Yoruba guy from Oyo State. He said, ah, we're intermarrying, we're in-laws. Your in-law will come one day. 
I am telling you this. Look at look at the Idomas. Those communities have been decimated. They don't even have a history of Fulani occupation. But now we are beginning to see that they are migrating into those communities. It's a it's a migration issue. So where does this stop? I keep asking that question. Where does it stop? Your traditional rulerships are being diluted. They are going to set up traditional rulerships to rule themselves and, and say, go to hell with your rulerships. Let me tell you, I grew up where in, in a place where they were the minorities. They were the nicest people. Nicest people you can ever meet. Now that they are the majority in Just Not, please go to Just Not on a Friday and see if you would not die. They have already started in Edo State, in Benin. They blocked the road during prayers. You've seen that during, that is what happens when they become the majority. When people come on Clubhouse and say, ah, I have friends that are Fulani. I also have friends that are Fulani. You think it's only you that has monopoly on friends? But I will tell you, this issue <laughs> is not about minority friendship. It's about the Fulani oligarchy. If you cannot set, set, differentiate between Fulani, um, the normal average Fulani and the Fulani oligarchy, then we need to st take a 101 course with you. So when people are clamoring for self-determination, these are very valid claims. We have to be careful on how we won't validate these experiences we need to go back to the spirituality of our forefathers when our forefathers said we shouldn't intermarry we thought they were tribal they were tribalists bigots look at what's happened the fate of the middle Belters who are progressives and who have intermarried when they said when when our fathers say that there's a when a, what a small guy can cannot see um, if he climb, uh, an old man can see sitting down, a small boy will not see if he climbs a tree. We didn't know this. Let me tell you this. We have a history with these people from the Middle Belt pre-colonial. Pre we have a history with these people colonial. We have a history post-colonial. What makes you think that all of a sudden in 2021, they will bury the hatchet and say, oh, because you are who? Let me tell you something. This will not end. It, will it has taken centuries and it will continue taking centuries. We need to go back to our spirituality of the past. That is the only way. If you can use your current spirituality, Christianity, Islam, whatever, to fight this, fine and good but at the moment i'm not seeing that working in the south i'm not seeing that working in the east and certainly i haven't seen that work in the middle belt thank you thank you so much wow that was huge um Obiri, i'm going to have you speak for uh, a minute or two before we go PTR. Thank you, Mr. Bami. Mr. Patrick, thank you very much for your wisdom, for your insight. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. Okay. Um, Bami, you should have asked for a round of applause before you even handed over. <laughs> yeah, my bad. My bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Please, you all should call 